Welcome back, you guys. If you've been a longtime subscriber, thank you so much for your continued support. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm Dustin, and we're gonna go over an awesome cut and flip with Dakota Madrona. He's gonna do platonic solids on the cut and flip. Super awesome stuff, so stay tuned for that. And at the end of this video, we're gonna be giving away a couple of Terp screws for you guys, and the stuff from last week, which is the fountain pen and the opals. So stay tuned to the end to see if you won the giveaway, and I think we might have a blooper on this one too, so check that out as well. So I wanted to give a huge shout out and thank you to Dakota Madrona for coming to teach a workshop. It was an amazing class. This teaching style is really great and animated and energetic. So if you haven't checked out the workshop, please go to revereglass.com and check out the Dakota Madrona workshop. There's a lot of great information in there and he made this amazing mantis. There's a short open house that we put up on YouTube. You guys are welcome to check that out as well. Revereglass.com for that content, plus tons of other stuff and a community of glass blowers like you trying to get into the craft and meet other people who have a passion for the same thing. Next month, we have a very special guest artist coming for another workshop, Gus Glass. It's called Wigging Out. We're gonna be going over line work, wig wags, eight hours, all day long. You can watch it on any device, anywhere in the world. Interact directly with Gus or myself, and that's gonna be on October 23rd from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. California time. So please hit the link there in the bottom, sign up for the class. For the first five people that sign up using the promo code Wiggin with Gus. You guys will get 25% off, plus any members of the online school get additional discounts. So make sure that you sign up for a membership to the online school as well. I want to thank our sponsor, Mountain Glass Arts. They are the number one supplier and best place to get anything that you want in the industry from opals to tools, torches, kilns, color, clear. They'll ship anywhere in the world. Their customer service is super on point. They plant a tree with every order. I really appreciate everything that they do for the industry personally, and I know that you guys do too. So feel free to place your order with Mountain Glass, tell them that you saw it at Revere Glass, and I think they'll even give you 5% off on your first order. So thanks again, Mountain Glass Arts, and we really appreciate your support along with everybody else in the community. Make sure you watch the video all the way to the end to see if you've won the fountain pen or the opals. Make sure you comment on the video with questions or anything about your journey with glass, and that gives you an opportunity for a chance to win this week's giveaway, which is gonna be the Terp Screws. And we're also gonna be giving away this V-Blade, uh, courtesy of Mountain Glass Arts. They've given this to me to give to one of you guys. So comment on the video. I'll send you out this V-Blade or the Terp Screws. Again, I really appreciate all you guys' support. It's so fun working with you. If you want a little bit closer interaction, if you want mentorship, please go to revereglass.com. All right, you guys, let's get in the studio with Dakota and check out this cut and flip. All right, you guys, welcome to the studio. I'm super excited to be able to share this demo with you. We left all the cameras set up, so we have five camera angles. This is the same way that the workshops are set up. So for these, you can see there's so many different angles that you can see this amazing drawing going down. And Dakota was kind enough to share with you guys on the torch, uh, the cut and flip method that he used. So I'll let him introduce himself and you know a little bit about how he got into glass it's definitely a huge honor to have him here and i'm really excited that he wanted to share this with you guys yeah hey guys uh thank you thank you dustin for having me um as you can see as he mentioned i'm uh doing a cut and flip i got the opportunity to use all these cameras it's an absolutely amazing opportunity uh, about six years ago actually uh, i got to come out to california and i took some lessons with dustin so uh, when I was just, uh, you know, a couple of years into glass blowing, I didn't really, you know, I, I had been doing it for a little while, but hadn't been, um, you know, I, I uh, definitely needed some work, some tips and tricks and some, some fundamentals and, and some education. So I uh, took a couple of lessons from Revere. I got to fly out to California. I, I live all the way on the East Coast. So um, I got to fly all the way out to California and I spent a couple hours with Revere uh, and he showed me how to make a flask and he showed me how to do some milli work and he showed me how to do some wine glass bases and every little thing that he showed me um, really just played a huge part in the next couple of years of my career. And uh, then six years later, uh, now I'm back here at his studio 
getting to teach a lesson as opposed to uh, getting to learn one. And it was a really, really special, special thing. So uh, I got to teach a lesson in this workshop, uh, which I recommend everybody go to uh, revereglass.com and go sign up for his workshops because there's a lot of information out there and he's piling these workshops up and they are so cool. As he mentioned, there are five HD 1080 4K cameras <laughs> staring at this glass with some of the best filters you can buy. And it is really something else when you look at it in person. When you're here and you see the, see the actual setup, it is something like, uh, it looks like a movie. It looks like the set of a movie. And I was really lucky to get the opportunity to be filmed uh, and get to play around with the cameras. Because uh, as you guys know, I like to play with the camera. But uh, this time I got to play with some real professional equipment. And I really had a great time. And so I'm back here six years later. You know, uh, so after six full years back here hanging out with Dustin and um, it's yeah. really just been a great time. I, I've been here for about a week. He has been the best host I could ever ask for. <laughs> oh man, thank you. That, that's really nice. That means a lot. It's, it's super important to me that when I invite somebody out here, either a teacher or a private lesson comes out, that it, it's a comfortable space and it just enhances and really creates the environment for creativity and passion. So I'm, I'm glad that you got to experience that. I noticed that when you're putting on these shapes, that you're doing some dots ahead of time. And, you know, I, I think those dots are probably really important in guiding those lines. You want to tell these guys what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, those those lines uh, or rather those dots, um, they're kind of like um, it's almost like playing connect the dots. So if you've ever done a connect the dot kind of um, worksheet when, in elementary school, it's a little bit like that where it kind of just shows you where you're going. Uh, some people will use a tungsten pick to kind of poke at the glass and create that. Uh, I don't do that because sometimes that can create an air, air pocket. Um, some other people will use a tie pen. You can actually tie pen to the surface and it will guide you. Uh, but basically those little dots are guiding me and knowing exactly how to connect A to B. Have you ever heard of anyone using a Sharpie and then it burning out and leaving a slight residue? And then as you go over that line, the line actually disappears. Have you ever seen that one? I haven't seen it. I've uh, theorized using that technique and I've drawn on glass and kind of tried to play with it, but I've never actually gotten it to do exactly what I wanted. And, yeah. But um, but yes, I, I definitely think that's Yeah, I've, I've seen that before. It's do. hard. I tried it. Exactly. It like burns off super quick. Right? Yeah. 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 Anyway, I think, think the idea, you guys, is that if you put some guidelines down any way that you can, that you're going to come out with a better drawing in the end. Um, and also another important factor here is these lines, these outer lines, making those as crisp and clean as possible makes the whole rest of your picture clean and crisp. So just like with the filicello or any drawing, these outside lines really dictate how that's going to come out in the end. Yeah, those outside lines are really one of the most important parts of the piece. Uh, and if you do get those lines too hot, you can bleed them out. Uh, they'll, they'll get too hot and, and actually melt down to the surface. And they won't be that dark anymore. Um, so and that can be a real problem. So a big thing what you're trying to do is not get it too hot because those lines are what's going to dictate how your uh, image looks. All, all it, They really are the biggest part of what makes your image look like your image. That, that's what gives it the crisp look, or those crispy little lines. How many um, flips do you think you've drawn over the years? Because like- It's an uncountable super, amount. Like so many, right? It's un, it, absolutely uncountable amount. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, you, you guys should definitely be checking out his work on Instagram, but a lot of his work has to do with filicellos and flips. And I mean, of course the Terp screw, which I think you guys know about. And by the way, watch this video to the end. We're going to be giving one of you guys a Terp screw because we can't give you this piece because this is a clad piece, but we do want to get you something that he made. So we'll be giving away a little Terp screw uh, for you guys. But anyway, um, he's done this so many times and, and it's really important to remember that all this comes with a lot of practice and that you can do this yourself right there watching this video that with practice you can do these techniques and more and get even better because when we started blowing glass we didn't have this kind of access to be able to watch somebody do something you know at this level so um, 
yeah, just keep practicing, you guys. You guys could totally do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, practice makes perfect definitely comes into play here. And I will tell you that when it comes to disc flips, filicellos, anything like that, um, it really is just uh, trial and error and experience of doing it over and over and over again. And that is what why I've actually seen a lot of people say is they say, hey man, I've tried flips, but I, I stopped doing it um, because it, it was just, it, it was so difficult and I wasn't getting, you know, and so I just stopped doing it altogether and after just a handful of them. And it's like, well, it's really just doing it again and again and again and again, and it gets better and better. And going along with that, that goes right into this piece exactly, where the first time I did this, um, this is actually what you're watching is the third try. I, this is the third attempt at making this section. And I actually did it between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. Uh, after I shattered the other one. So I, uh, my yeah, first- Yeah, make sure you stay to the end and um, watch all the video all the way through. And at the end, we actually have a blooper, small blooper reel for you guys, where you can see number two, crash and burn. And <laughs> you can see Dakota's reaction to that. Um, so make sure you stay to the end for that. But yeah, I mean, again, it's like, you guys like some of this stuff is really difficult and frustrating and so you just have to kind of power through it and realize that you know you're doing this for the experience and the process of blowing glass and that's that's where the love comes in is the process and it's not the finished piece the finished pieces are cool and you know all, all the stuff surrounding the culture is amazing but for you as a glass blower love the process you know if it messes up love making another one love getting better Totally, totally, exactly. And really just, it, it is doing it again and again and again and just working on it and trying to better yourself. And you know, the first one I made, it looked really bad. And like, you know, it, it, the drawings themselves were, um, you know, not quite as good as what you're watching right here, but they were, they were okay, but I messed up the flip. Second one, you know, it was okay, but I was still working on a little bit of, uh, a couple things like sizing the images together and, and they're just little things, you know? And, and once I went in there and I got my third try at it, third, third time's the charm. And you know, I, I really, I, I came out with something that I was way more proud of. And that's just a micro version of the, the more macro version that is the long-term of learning glass. You know, I did all this in a matter of a couple days with one project, but the same thing applies to your whole career as a whole. You know, you go in there, you try something, and maybe it doesn't go your way, but you know, you just go in there, you do it again and again, and oh, look at that. Third time's a charm, looks amazing. And you end up getting that way more satisfaction out of it too than you would have if you mastered it the first try. So what's the trick here where you're drawing inside the lines? Do you, I see that you're kind of melting it in and just trying to like, I guess, get the glass to kind of just fill in that whole area in one shot. Um, where I see some people like draw little lines or little dots in this area. So tell me a little bit about um, your process about filling these in. Totally, so the triangle's a good, uh, a good example for that. Uh, the triangle, um, it has little points. So really your main goal when you're filling this in is just avoiding bubbles. You're just really trying to avoid trapping bubbles underneath where you're filling it. Uh, and um, so the main thing I really try to do is make sure that I get the glass, I, I get the glass, I make sure that the colored glass is molten enough to be pulled into the corner. See how I'm pulling back into corners so that it can fill up that corner. Other, otherwise, you'll have like, you can go in and try to squish glass onto a corner and those corners will end up with bubbles in them because they're just such small little um, areas that have a 3D surface. So it's, you know, two little bumps and in between that bump, it's hard to get that glass in there without a bubble. So that's a lot of my goal here uh, is, is uh, just trying to avoid bubbles. And to answer your question more specifically, as far as why I was trying to get it all in one go, as opposed to doing multiple strips of lines, is that what I've noticed is the more that you do multiple lines next to each other, what can happen sometimes is that you'll get the surface of the glass you're drawing on too hot, or the colors that you're working with won't 
uh, work with each other very well, and you'll end up with um, a 3D effect with some glass when you're drawing. So let's say you're drawing, you know, just a square you're just, or a circle, you're just filling it in. So you gotta draw three lines next to each other. Um, you can either get the surface you're drawing on so hot that it ends up um, uh, caving in on itself so that when you actually flip it and you look at it, you'll see a bit of a 3D effect, like it's a mountain ridge in your glass because the glass ends up actually falling into the clear glass. Uh, so, or there's the other version where you'll be using a certain color where I've actually had some issues with kind of some like lighter blue colors have some issues with um, kind of like cadmium colors, certain things like, like some colors. Uh, when I go and draw them next to each other, they just won't melt together in a fashion once they're like lined down. So what ends up happening is the clear glass, instead of caving inward, caves towards your color and you end up with the same mountain ridges, this 3D effect of, you know, um, up and down, up and down, uh, almost looking like when you make um, uh, vac stacked tu uh, lined tubing. So when you have vac stacked lined tubing, the reason that it looks the way that it does and has those little bumps and ridges is because the clear glass is sucked into that color, the space between the color. So that same kind of idea or premise can happen when you're drawing. Uh, so that's why I really try to get a lot of it all in one go while it's all molten. So now you're just outlining each square individually, I mean each shape individually, and probably because you're going to want to protect that outer line and not have the main you know, background color accidentally slip into that, like, or, you know, why, even though that it's colored on there, would you ever consider just coating the whole thing in white or would you just always outline your shapes? You are spot on with uh, why I'm outlining them. I'm outlining them so that when I am getting the piece hot and adding glass to it, I don't accidentally heat up the image I drew and have it melt and bleed and move because I'm trying to retain that shape. You know, um, if I get one side of that triangle shape that I drew too hot in comparison to the other one, it's going to melt into the surface and kind of drip and, you know, glass is like a liquid and that's how it's gonna work. It's just gonna drip away and colors will either thin out or colors will, or the shape itself can change. So what I'm doing here is almost like giving it a big, uh, I'm, I'm adding the same amount of mass that the image has so that it doesn't have anywhere to go back or forth. You know, so when I start getting it hot and if those images get hot, it just won't move because it's being held into place by that color. Look at that. And I think that looks really beautiful. I think that's one of the treats that we get as glass blowers, you guys, is that some of these processes just like was so beautiful, like the reflection of the shapes, all perfect from the inside and like the lines of the color from the outside. I mean, this is something that I think we should just take a second and appreciate the process that we all get to participate in the glowing colors. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've been asked when I had Revere glass, you know, why, why do you always use orange as your color? I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's the color of the heat of the glass. But, um, anyway, yeah. So now another thing that I've noticed Dakota does, um, which is, is I, I think a little unique to his style is marveling or paddling, you know, kind of in the air like that, like holding up your paddle like a marver and then being able to angle both the paddle and the piece, you know, it, in conjunction with each other, you know, tell us a little bit about that technique right there that you're doing. Yeah, it's actually a good time that you're asking about that because right now, um, as I'm heating this section, uh, I'm trying to get this section as hot as possible because I need it to go melt through like three or four layers of glass but I can't get it too hot because I don't want the image to start moving around. So I'm really slowly working this piece and getting it really hot, but not trying to get it too hot, you know, so um, all at once. So um, uh, as, as you saw when I was working with the Marver, uh, while I'm working this piece back and forth, it wanted to start uh, condensing on me. 
So it started to condense back on me and starting to kind of uh, make a, a smaller cylinder. You know, I've got my, you know, my cylinder shape. It started to want to condense back on me like you collect up a ball. You know, uh, if you just take a solid rod and you heat it up, it starts condensing and starting to condense. So as it was happening, I kind of angled myself and let it drip forward just a little bit using my hand paddle. So I'm still able to still control what's going on using gravity to my advantage while still marveling. Yeah, that's super cool. It's definitely something that I don't see very much. It takes a lot of control to be able to do that, you guys. It takes a lot of strength too. So uh, start off small if you're gonna do this, this technique right here with a smaller piece of glass and a small oh, yeah. paddle because that, that strength and that uh, steady hand on both sides, that takes practice, years of practice. Especially this dance also takes a lot of practice. So don't try it, something that funky right away. Try something a little simpler, you guys. So you're gonna pop this out and cut this up. What are you gonna do now? Yeah, so I guess right here is where uh, I finished it all up. I made sure that it was as melted as I could get it. So now I'm, I'm gonna open this section. I, I make it a tube again, because the idea right now is I basically gotta make this thing a piece of paper and then, fl and then uh, turn it back into a tube. So that's the idea. So I'm taking this tube, I'm gonna cut the tube down one side of the tube, flatten it out to a piece of paper, and then fold it back the other way. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to kind of visualize it um, is if you took a piece of paper and you folded it into a cylinder and then unfolded it to a flat piece, that's the basic concept behind this cut and flip. And right now he's working on the seam. This is where that seam of that paper would be. And we're going to separate that with some shears and that way we can unfold the piece of paper to be flat. You can also draw on flat bore silicate. It's actually a product of flat bore silicate sheet and they come in different sizes. I think you can probably grab those from Mountain Glass Arts. Um, I haven't personally experimented with that, trying to draw it flat and then bringing it up, but I think it'd probably theoretically be possible. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's, it, it's very possible. And I actually know somebody um, that primarily does that for all of his production work. He pretty much only does uh, prototypes um, but what he purpose what he specifically does is grab those flat sections and he does like rapid rakes and weird drawings and stuff and then he just turns it into a tube and makes a pipe out of it and that's pretty much what he's done his entire career yeah I think that would open up some really interesting techniques for drawing and you know designs that you could put on a flat piece and then wrap that up I have a little sheet here maybe I'll Maybe I'll throw this into one of the demos sometime for you guys and see if we can experiment with this thing because I've had it sitting here for years and super interested to see what we could do with it. Oh, you're going to put the punny there. Yeah, there's a couple different ways I could have done this. Um, but again, this was 6.30 in the morning and I was trying to move real fast. Uh, but I, uh, but yeah, so I connect the punty up on, onto one side because the general idea right now is I got to make the other side kind of opened up just like the, the, the other side. So I have to make the opposing side to the punty. I have to open that up too because it, it's got to match. Um, How long have you been working with that knife on your bench? Oh, that's a weird knife. I, I uh, don't even know why I brought that. No, my normal knives are... You brought that uh, on a plane? Yeah, yeah, my normal, well, uh, check bag. Oh, check bag. Uh, my normal knives are Balasong, the butterfly knives. Uh -huh. Those are my normal knives, but I won't travel with them because they're like illegal in some states, I think. This one? Um, yeah, and yeah. California, especially. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I don't ever travel with the actual knives I use. Um, that knife there, you'll notice, it's held together with a zip tie. Uh, it, I, uh, fa I, I, like, I've had that knife probably since I was like 16, and I just found it in an old box and was like, Oh, weird. Like, I think I could fix this with a zip tie. And I fixed it with a zip tie. So it's just a weird one. And, and it works. You know, I, I can, you know, uh, yeah, get it as hot as I want and like destroy it and not care. Whoa, this is interesting. So there we go. So totally, check this out. Uh, so I totally new way. Yeah. So super I, cool. I flipped it over, got that um, there. And so that was a really important uh, thing I learned. I actually learned this from BMFT. You guys uh, should he, check out his work. Amazing yep. work. Yes, BMFT does and incredible really work. Really wonderful human. I don't know him too well, but everything I've seen. He's um, a pretty nice guy. Yeah. I've gotten to talk to him a couple times. And yeah, so as you see, I'm actually using gravity to my advantage here. Look at that. So I was holding it at one side, heating it up, 
and gravity just allowed it to kind of unroll for me. But it's not doing all the work, you know, glass is fidgety. Some areas are gonna, you know, not wanna move. Some areas are gonna be thicker than others, even just by like a hair of a millimeter or, you know, some stuff like that. As you can see, like the edge of one side isn't wanting to go flat as much as the other and certain things like that. But the general idea is I'm getting it nice and warm, not molten, but warm. And look at that, I'm flattening it out. I think it's really cool to see this method because it's this is clearly designed to preserve that picture so much by going so slow and attaching the punny in that direction and letting gravity do the work versus you know the way that um you know i taught myself because cut and flip like i mean when i started doing cut and flip there was literally nobody blowing glass practically so that's a really interesting way to do it yeah, so what you'll see right here is that I'm going to use gravity to my advantage again, but the opposite way. And the force. See that? As you see. Very, very cool. And just oh, wrap right. that around. Yeah, you get that nice and hot and it's just slowly wrapping itself back the other way now using gravity. But once you start getting closer and closer and it starts being more taco shaped, you're going to start actually using your tools a little bit more to push it in the direction you want. because you're going to be working a little, you have a little less mass to allow the gravity to work with you. So there we go. So uh, you'll see I'll start using the paddle a little bit on the edges to start making it a little more spherical. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool to see, you know, that's that's one thing I love about glass blowing is that there's so many paths to a similar end and a similar goal like i just it's so cool to see all these little tricks and these different ways to do things and then be able to kind of put together grab something out of this technique that you like grab something out of that technique kind of put it together and just you know it, i just yeah I'm, I'm always amazed when i see something i've done so many times done in a different way yeah, that, that, that's always been uh, really interesting to me. I, I, I'm right on board with you. Well, one of the best parts about working with an artist is actually seeing them do something that you've done a billion times, but in an entirely different method. And you're like, what? I would never have even thought of that, you know? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And then as soon as you see something, you're like, oh, that's logical because glass is logical. You know, ultimately yeah. you see something and you're always like, oh yeah, of course, that would make sense. Technically, that would make sense. Most things, anyway, almost everything is like that with glass. And so every time I see something new with glass, for me and the way that I think of it, it's just like, oh, that seems so logical, of course, you know? Totally. Yeah, if you guys think of glass as logic, it'll help you along the way for sure. Glass is gonna move, it's predictable. Glass is very predictable. It has the same properties, whether you're cutting it like this or cutting it like that, using a flame or scissors, you know, flipping it this way or that way. Ultimately, glass is moving around the same way and the molecules have the same effect when you're heating them up, they start moving faster. Yeah, one of my favorite rules that I tell people, I say the golden rule when I'm teaching beginners, uh, it sounds really uh, simplistic and silly when you say it out at first, but it really, um, actually means a lot later on you'll, you, um, when, when it comes into play, but what you get hot is what will move. And it sounds so simple, you're like, yeah. well, duh, you know? But right here, you know, like, what will get hot is what's gonna move, so I'm just getting those little edges hot, and I'm slightly pushing it, and you'll notice the rest of the piece didn't move, you know? I, so, not, so none of my ge geometrics got messed up, nothing, you know? So that's a, it's a key element, and that's just basic logic. And I think, that, yeah, I think that something that goes along with that heated up where you want it to move is that adjust your torch to the size that you want to get hot. A lot of people, when they first start off, they're adjusting their torch a little bit less, but you can adjust, take the time to adjust to a small flame if you're working on a small area. You know, take the time to adjust to a big flame if you want to heat up a large area. Again, it seems like a simple thing, but sometimes we get in the moment and we're so focused on what we're doing we don't take time to just slow down, adjust the torch to make that process as easy as possible for us. So now you're gonna attach a blow tube. What's next on here? Yeah, so what I just did is I got it to a cylinder, but I was still attached to the punty. So what I did is I heated up and marvered one side so that I could connect up a blow tube. Now I've just got an open tube. So now my goal is, is to 
uh, get it perfectly cylinder because what I'm doing right here is just making sure I'm doing the little intricate things to make sure that it is perfectly cylinder because it was close to cylinder but it's still you know like I said it's three or four layers of glass it's all kind of funky so I just heated it up used my uh, um, bowl push a little bit to make sure it was cylinder. Now I'm going to just do the normal marver and close up this tube so that I can, um, so that it's just a normal tube that I can then blow into. And from there I can actually really melt it down. Look at that. And look at how those shapes came out. It's, it's so cool to see that they have that depth and three dimensionality. Like I use different shades of the colors on the different walls to like, you know, uh, show the lighting, basically show the shadow of the light on the piece. I think that's definitely adds a lot to the piece. Like very cool to see. Shading's always, always takes a little bit of practice and we're kind of limited in our colors. And now we have more colors than we've ever had before. Yeah. But uh, you know, before we had, you know, if we had an orange, we were very lucky and yeah. orange, one orange. And uh, now we have multiple shades of all these colors, which is, is really a blessing from the uh, color companies that have made such a tremendous strides in color chemistry in the last 10 years. Yeah, that has been a major, major difference in the past 10, 10 15 years. It's just uh, exponentially growth in colors. You know, even, you know, I haven't even been doing it as long as Revere, but even just in my, uh, just during in my career, the, uh, the colors have exponentially grown. Back uh, in my day, we only had four colors. That's true. We did only have four colors when I started. Back in my day, we only had one black. Yeah. <laughs> then you, we had blue, cobalt blue, ruby mm -hmm. red, uh, uh, amber purple, and yellow or something like that. Yeah. Those were like the basic colors mm -hmm. that we had. So you're just coating a little bit more in clear over here? Yeah, I didn't like how it looked, so I gave it a little scrape because it looked like a little bit of that white made its way out. Uh -huh. And then uh, and then I gave it a little bit of a clear coat just to match up with everything else. Uh, and now I go into that seal because the, the most stressed out, messed up part of that piece is going to be where that seal came together. So where that seal came together, I got it extra, extra hot, kind of even blew it out a bit just to make sure that I got it. Uh, really connected to one piece of glass. Then I melted it back down. And then from here, this is where I do the final meltdown and I just make it the final cylinder and the final section to turn it into whatever I'm turning it into. Yeah, we're, I, we're, I'm excited to be able to work with this section and I'm gonna turn it into uh, the center portion of a droplet. And on my sections, I'm gonna be doing reticello um, and then putting that together. So you guys can check this piece out on um, dustinrevere.com or I will drop it on our Instagrams too. Um, definitely, we're, we're excited to put this one together. Just kind of doing some final touch up on the shaping here and celebrating. That is my <laughs> 7 a.m. celebration of I did this. Hell yeah. Definitely good to enjoy the celebration moments in life. Super, super fun having you out here. Here's the piece for you guys to check out. So you can see the different shapes that have been drawn, the original outer lines and the different colors that were used to create lighting and shading and three dimensionality. And of course, there's the Terp screw. Um, yeah, we're giving away a, a brand new Terp screw. So uh, uh, it's uh, not all Terp screws are universally sized, but this guy is one of the most common ones, fit a mini XL Toro, but that's all a giveaway for you guys. Yeah, just comment on the video. Let us know what you thought, any feedback, where you were going with Glassboy and how your journey's been, any questions you'd like answered. And of course, we'll be giving this Terp screw away to one of you guys. I can't thank you enough, Dakota, for coming out here and sharing this with everybody. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. And I'm so glad that we had enough time to make this on the Torch video. I can't thank you enough, man. I, this was a... The, one of the best opportunities I've ever had in my life. And I've had an absolute blast this week. Cool, well thanks man, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you, hopefully, yeah, see you soon. Welcome back you guys. I wanted to give a big thank you for Dakota Madrona for doing an additional demo just for you guys for On The Torch and YouTube. That was awesome to see him work. He is so good with drawing flips, so I have a lot of respect for his work. I have a couple questions that you guys have asked. The first one is from John Doe. 
He wants to know what the opals that we use in glass are made out of. And it's a great question because the opals are not actually natural opals. They're synthetic opals made in a factory. And they're made from a company, originally they're called Gilson Opals. So they're made in a lab and they're compatible with borosilicate glass. I'm not exactly sure what the components are. That might be a secret recipe, but they're not natural opals. Natural opals have water, so they won't be able to be encased. If you're looking for opals to buy, check out Mountain Glass Arts. They have tons of great opals that you can encase. They're really fun to use. The next question is also about opals from I'm a Bandit. They're asking what my favorite ways to use opals are in glasswork. I like using opals encased and I like using them really anywhere that I can. Some great tricks about opals are they can cover up any scars, marks, or bubbles in your work, but I think they really enhance the work in general. They're not very expensive and they are so sparkly and beautiful, so I like to use them anywhere that I can. I have a little collection of opals that I have. And I love going in there and picking out a good one. In particular, I like the spherical opals. They're really easy to encase and they look great once they're encased and have that magnification on them. Thanks again for the question. The last question is from Chucky Whiskers. He's asking, how important is a saw in a glass shop? I actually think a saw is a pretty important tool in a glass shop if you can afford it. A good saw to get would be a tile saw. Any sort of wet diamond saw would work. The saw that I use is a Gemini XT Revolution, and that's a ring saw diamond saw, of course, that has water going around the blade so that when you cut through glass, it provides some lubricant and some cooling so you can move all the way through the glass. Having a saw in your shop allows you to make perks, allows you to take your pieces off cold, off the blow tube, and it allows you to do some other cold working things that would be very difficult to achieve without a saw. For just a few hundred dollars, you can get a saw. You can find those at a local hardware store. I'm sure Mountain Glass has some as well. I think a saw is a pretty important tool to get in a glass shop. Then again, I'm a tool hoarder, so I think most tools are pretty important. All right, you guys, it's time for the winners. I'm gonna give these opals away to Backwoods Glassworks. Thanks so much for watching the videos. It's really great to see other glass blowers enjoying these. I'm gonna send these opals out to you. Just use the chat on the website on the bottom right of any page to let us know that you won and we'll ship them out to you. Thanks again, Backwoods Glassworks. All right, you guys, I'm gonna give the pen and ink set to Isaac Maxwell. Thank you so much for watching the videos. I'm really excited to see what you do with the calligraphy and that you have an interest in it. Please post anything that you do on the Borrow Babble forum on the website, revereglass.com. I'd love to see what you do with it. Thanks so much for watching the videos, Isaac, and I'm happy to ship this out to you. Please use the chat on the bottom right of any page on the website. Let us know that you won and we'll ship it out to you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. Make sure you check out the Tagoda Madrona workshop on Revere Glass. Please sign up for the Gus Glass workshop using the promo code Wigan with Gus for 25% off. I'll see you guys in two weeks with another On the Torch video. Thanks again for watching. We're gonna go over an awesome, and we're gonna go off, and we're gonna go over an awesome disc, and we're gonna go, and we're going to go off. Test, Cody. You're testing oh, the I'm peas for the pops. <laughs> <laughs> Got to test those pops and Pop. peas. One, two, Pop. three. One, two, three. Test, testing. One, two, three with the peas and Mike, the pops. Test. Hold on, Cody. One at a time. Oh, I'm sorry. You let me know. <laughs> Mike, test. And see if you've won the fountain. Make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you watch the... Whoa. <laughs>